right, good evening, everybody. We're going to have you stand up with us. We're going to join together and sing Little as Much When God is in It. Thank you so much for that singing. Uh, we're going to open up our service this evening uh, with a word of prayer. I'm going to ask Brother Leon, would you pray for us tonight? All right, if you will, please take your Bibles, open them up to 1 Timothy uh, chapter number 5. Uh, we are continuing our study in 1 Timothy. Our study, as we look at uh, 1 Timothy, it's a study uh, that, that focuses on leadership. The Apostle Paul writing to Timothy, his son in the faith, who is who is uh, taking a church there at Ephesus, going to pastor, and there's the, uh, the charge and the uh, commencement of duty, all those things being uh, presented there before. But, but we recognize through this uh, and, and through the entirety of the New Testament how the child of God, those who are, who are uh, blood-bought and redeemed, those who are uh, uh, recipients of salvation, we also are recipients of a call or a commissioning, the great commission of Christ to go and to teach and to baptize. And uh, with, all, with that specific thing and everything else that God calls us to do consistently, we recognize that all of us, those of us who are children of God, we are all called to be leaders in some form, some fashion. Amen? We can agree with that, right? Uh, and so uh, as being called uh, uh, leaders, uh, we recognize that a lot of what we see happening here applies to us directly, uh, some indirectly, but it's all uh, things that we can learn from. And so as Paul has written to Timothy, and uh, the, uh, we, we saw his, his address concerning the church, uh, there was a lack of truth that was being presented and a lot of false doctrine that was being presented. And so he addresses that in chapter 1. And uh, the, uh, uh, a misconception of what the law of God is for, its purpose, its reason uh, for being. And uh, he clears that up and how the law of God points out our need of salvation which drew him and should draw others to a relationship with Jesus Christ and a love for Jesus Christ. Uh, he goes from that uh, to living a life of faith. And then uh, chapter 2, he talked about three different labors of love being prayer, um, uh, soul winning, uh, and public worship. Chapter 3, the requirements of uh, leadership within the body, the spiritual leaders, the secular leaders, or uh, those that are um, uh, elected by the church that aren't the pastor, but like deacons and trustees and stuff. Um, and then the servant leaders, which is what all of us should, should strive to be. Uh, examples of, of leadership and the, uh, the service that we promote. And uh, the last being first and the first being last kind of thing. Uh, so he talks about leadership. And then in chapter number four, he goes from talking about the, the general thing concerning the church to talking about uh, or giving the charge to Timothy as far as the life that he is supposed to live. He's talked about the warning, the deception uh, that's, that's going to take and is already taking uh, Christian leaders by 
uh, um, uh, the, the false truths that are being presented, how it's crumbling and, and taking them away from the faith. The duties of a Christian leader. These are how you protect yourself against this. This is how you are to live and, and to guard. You are to exercise your faith, exercise yourself under righteousness and be ready for any and every attack of the enemy. And then he goes from that to, uh, I, I would consider this section one of the more practical uh, sections. It actually goes all the way through chapter 6, verse number 2. So chapter 5, verse 1 to chapter 6, verse 2. Uh, he's going to be dealing with uh, um, Timothy's responsibility and his, uh, his approach to dealing with the body of Christ as a Christian leader. And so... This is how you are to treat others. This is how you are to treat these individuals. This is how you are to carry yourself and the way that you are to view them. His dealings as Christian leader, Timothy needs to understand and recognize, and we need to understand and recognize that the, uh, the, the calling that's on his life and the requirements on, in his life of how to deal with people inside of the church is something that pertains to all of us. We we have the example of the pastor who is, uh, uh, who is showing us how we are to treat one another. Timothy, you treat the people of the church this way so that they'll know how to treat one another. If you have inside of a, a, a normal home, if you, if you have a, a husband or a wife that's always degrading or tearing down their, their spouse... Uh, it doesn't take long before that is manifest in the children's lives, right? If you're always uh, uh, talking down or uh, ridiculing mom or dad, then the kids are going to learn from that and start being just as disrespectful. And so he, he's, he wants Timothy to understand his responsibility as a leader in the church, but also we need to all recognize our responsibility as leaders, uh, called leaders of how we are to treat one another. And so with that being said, we're only going to be looking at two uh, verses this evening. Uh, verses 1 and 2, 1 Timothy chapter number 5. Paul says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the older women as mothers, and the younger as sisters with all purity. This, this, these two verses is dealing with the fellowship with the saints. How can so many different individuals with different backgrounds, different uh, age groups, different generations, uh, with different mindsets and experiences of life, with different emotions, how can we come together and worship together, coexist without tearing each other apart, right? Right? How is it that we uh, can be, uh, I mean, we, we all are unified in our uh, love for God and our uh, love for the Savior and, and in our, uh, our cherishing of the, uh, of the salvation that He has provided for us. We all have that in common if we're children of God, but that doesn't, that doesn't always mean that me and so-and-so are going to get along. There's some people that just have personalities that clash, right? Um... I'm thankful the Bible tells us we're to love everybody. It doesn't tell us we have to like everybody uh, because I, I would be in a world of hurt, right? There's some people that um, the things they say, the, the things that they do, their personality, I mean, they just rub you the wrong way. J just being honest. This is me being upfront, open, and honest, right? We, we can all be that way. There, there, there are some of you uh, that are like me that, uh, that if a very specific name was mentioned, I mean, it would, your ears would turn red and you'd get upset just hearing their name. Because we've all been done wrong before. We've all been mistreated uh, before. We're supposed to forgive and forget, but uh, that, that, that's the requirement. We recognize that, but that doesn't mean that we're all at that, at that uh, position in life where, where we even want to hear their names. Men and women, mind-blowing, are not the same. And should be treated with 
decency and respect based on who and what they are. And our level of respect should also come from who and what we are. This is especially true within the body of Christ. There are certain things that we should say and things that we shouldn't say. Amen? Not everything that needs to be said needs to be said. Certain ways that we should act and certain ways that we shouldn't act. Certain things we should do and certain things that we shouldn't do. And with men and women being different, everybody having different backgrounds, everybody having different experiences of life and personalities, we recognize if we're going to coexist, if we're going to work together as a unified local assembly of the body of Christ and be effective for what He has called us to do, which is reach our communities, if we're going to be successful in that, we got to learn how to get along. we got to learn how to be uh, unified in the things that matter the most. Treating each other with respect and decency. Paul addresses these differences and, and the, the need for unity while putting the concentration on this word rebuke in, in verses 1 and 2. He focuses on rebuking. Why, why would there be a focus here? We're supposed to dwell in unity. Uh, why, uh, we're supposed to get along. We are a part of the body of Christ why, working together. What, why would he focus on rebuke? Because rebuke is never something anybody wants to hear. There, there's always occasion, there's going to be an occasion for it and uh, nobody wants to hear it. If we've messed up, if we're doing wrong, uh, none of us want to be called to the carpet by somebody else. We'd much rather receive the rebuke of the Lord and be able to take care of it on our own. We don't want the embarrassment. We don't want the confrontation. We don't want any of those things. So the Apostle Paul is focusing on the need for unity and getting along and accomplishing the Lord's will, working together as the body of Christ, how we can dwell in unity. He does all this by talking about rebuke. This is how you rebuke somebody. If you can rebuke somebody the right way, kind of everything else is going to fall into, into place, right? And so he, he's uh, he concentrating on this word rebuke. Rebuke is uh, firm instruction given towards another individual. Firm instruction. Some may well call it criticism constructive criticism um, but it's a firm instruction given towards another individual aimed at immediate correction if I was going to rebuke you of something that you've done it would be for the purpose of you doing something about it and doing something about it now no individual is perfect and because of that, no church is perfect. Every individual has his own besetting sins, his own imperfections, his own fleshly appetites. And because the church is made up of imperfect people, every church has its problems. Every church has its disagreements, its grievances, and its tensions. All of these things need to be dealt with in order to get over and to get beyond these differences, grievances. But there is a right way and a wrong way to do everything, right? We can do the right thing the wrong way, and we can do the right thing or the, uh, the wrong thing with uh, uh, the right way, so to speak. There's a right and a wrong way of doing everything. These first two verses that we've looked at uh, speak directly about the rebuking of others, but give us a broader understanding of how we are to treat one another. 
And it's interesting to me that in these two verses, as he's talking, he's starting off with the unity leadership and uh, the way he treats uh, those in his church and uh, how, how that is to be an example for us of how we are to treat one another. It's interesting to me in the four different ways that he tells us to treat one another or the four different categories of people that are mentioned here, all of them have to do with family. The older, treat them as a father. Older men. The older women, treat them as a mother. Younger men, treat them as a brother. Younger women, treat them as your sister. We are the family of God. By the way, we sang that song, we sing it every baptism. It's one of my favorite Christian songs. I love that song because it gives us a picture of, uh, of the way that the Lord God has set it up for us. We are all a part of the family of God. We call each other brother and sister. We may not do it as much as, as maybe they do in other churches, but we recognize the significance that is there. We have a heavenly father. That heavenly father sent his only son to die for us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the only son of God. We are all adopted into the family of God. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, no matter what our uh, color of our skin is, how much money we have, where the side of the tracks we come from, uh, what country we were born in. None of those things matter. If you are a blood-bought and redeemed child of God, you are my brother or you are my sister. And because of that, we need to, uh, we need to live uh, based on and treat each other in that way. Now, we know that not every family is a perfect family. I didn't always get along. I had two older brothers. I didn't always get along with them. We, we know that, uh, that not every family is a perfect family. Not, uh, not every uh, father or every mother was a good father or mother. We, we, we understand that. We recognize that. But we all know what it's supposed to be. Right? Kind of the leave it to beaver mentality. We, we know what a good dad looks like. We know what a good mom looks like, or uh, good siblings, good children. We, we know what it's supposed to be. It may not be a direct picture of our families or our experience, but we know what it's supposed to look like. And so uh, that's the mindset we go into this with as, as the Apostle Paul is dealing with these things. So with the fellowship with the saints, how are we able or how are we supposed to get along all of us being different and none of us being perfect? Well, he starts off by giving us an understanding of how the, uh, Timothy is supposed to treat the men of the church. Leader, this is how you're supposed to treat the men of the church. The first thing he says is rebuke not, right? Uh, rebuke not an elder. Paul is not telling Timothy to never rebuke a man that is older than him. We know that because as a pastor of that specific church, rebuke was part of his job. It's I understand that part of me as pastor preaching and teaching the word of God is to get up here and to be passionate and uh, and sincere concerning sin, whether you're involved in it or not. Uh, I'm not supposed to sugarcoat things. I'm supposed to present it as the Word of God tells me and instructs me and gives it to all of humanity. It's not an easy thing for me to say something that I know uh, is plaguing you. It's not, it's not that I'm doing it out of, uh, uh, out of a, having a hard heart or a judgmental heart. That's part of the job. If we talk one-on-one -on -one and... and and I reveal to you, or, or you reveal to me a struggle that you're having, and, uh, and you want to know why you can't get the victory over. And, and I'm honest and upfront with what the Word of God says is the problem. I'm not saying that so that I can be mean spirited or judgmental or think that I'm better than you in any way. That's part of rebuke. As a matter of fact, in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 2, the Apostle Paul, as he is uh, giving more instruction to Timothy, this is what he says. Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. So it, it, Paul, there's no way that he is saying you, you can uh, uh, 
rebuke everybody but older men. That's not what he's saying. He's giving us an understanding, all four of these categories, older men, young men, old women, uh, young women, all of them. He, he's talking about all of them in the way that the apostle, uh, the apostle Paul is telling Timothy, this is the way that you rebuke all of them, uh, all uh, categories. So rather, he is telling Timothy how to rebuke someone. And again, he's starting with the older men. Older men, Timothy, and again, he's not talking about everybody in this world. He's talking about the church, right? The men in the church that are older than you, Timothy, treat them as your father. Treat them in the, uh, the way that a father should be treated. If you're going to, uh, to point out an area of someone's life or you're going to uh, try to give instruction uh, with the purpose of immediate correction, if you're going to rebuke an older man inside of the church, you need to do it as if that man is your own father. Not as a rebellious child or not as someone who has, who has bitterness in his heart towards his father, but in the way that it should be, in the way uh, presented perfectly before you, that you know how. You should treat him as a loving father. Uh, you should treat him as a loving son towards a loving father, which means that you rebuke, you point out areas of, uh, of wrongdoing with the purpose of immediate correction. You do it with respect. Younger, inside the body of Christ. How do we treat older men in the church? We treat them with respect. It's over, I mean, I'll say amen to that. Because we have a lot of folks in here this evening that are older than me, and I respect the lives that you lived. I respect the battles you've been through. I respect the, uh, the, the families you've raised and the, the integrity that you have kept. We have some, some great men in the church, and because of uh, their position and because of who they are in the body of Christ, whether I've been saved longer than you or vice versa, whether my education uh, uh, goes past yours or, or not, whatever the case is, Based on who you are as a child of God, I'm to show you respect. How can I show respect for someone and point out areas of their life that need immediate correction? How can I respect you and say, I've noticed this about you and I think that it's it's going to bring judgment and it's keeping you from being all that God would have you to be. How can I do that without coming across the wrong way? How can I show that level of respect? I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to use Brother Leon. I, I'm not trying to disrespect him. I'm not saying he's involved in any kind of gross sin, so don't say that. But if I see Brother Leon is doing something that is detrimental to his testimony... That's going to uh, negatively affect God's ability to use him to reach this world, which is his calling in life, right? If it's going to uh, taint his testimony as a leader, if I see that Brother Leon is involved with something, how can I go to someone who's been saved uh, a lot longer than I have, who's been through so much more than I have, who's, who's got an extensive uh, knowledge of the Bible and who has a close, uh, uh, seemingly uh, uh, walk with God based on... The extent of his life. How can I go and say, I think that you're wrong in this? How can I do that in a respectful way? Well, approaching him as a, a father with rebuke means that I also show a little bit of restraint. Remember I said at the beginning, not everything that needs to be said needs to be said. We show a little bit of discernment use our brains, and we, uh, we try to, uh, to identify with and put ourselves in the same category and determine how it is that I would want to be treated, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? I show restraint. I don't come at the situation full of pride, or I don't even, if it's something that he's done against me that I'm calling him to the carpet on, uh, that I'm being honest with and that, I, uh, that I'm expecting him to, uh, to make immediate correction. I, I don't come at it with the attitude of I'm in the right and you are in the wrong uh, and uh, uh, 
show a bit of restraint. I don't need to be prideful and puffed up because that's a sin on my part, isn't it? How is it we get along as individuals in the body of Christ? Well, we treat the older as if they're uh, the older men as if they are our father, showing restra- uh, respect and restraint while living a life of righteousness. If, if I'm living right and doing right, not puffed up, not throwing it in his face, but if I am living right and doing right, the Holy Spirit is inside of me and the Holy Spirit is guiding me and directing me to say the right thing in the right situation at the right moment. So I'm showing him respect, which is what I'm supposed to do. I'm showing restraint. I'm not saying everything that's coming to my mind. I'm using some discernment. I'm doing my part in living a righteous life. And the reason that I come to to an individual as pastor of the church, if I came to Brother Leon, if I came to him to rebuke him, it would not be for the purpose of ridiculing or mocking or tearing him down. It would be for the purpose of restoration. Restoring him into right fellowship with God. Restoring him into right fellowship with the body of Christ. And restoring him into right relationship with me. If I go to someone and, it, and with rebuke, instruction with the purpose of immediate correction, if it's not for the purpose of restoring that relationship, fixing what is broken... Mending what is broken. I am in the wrong. And I'm, it'd be better if I just kept my mouth shut. So it's not that he's saying the older men in the church don't rebuke them ever. That's not what he's saying at all. He's, uh, uh, he's giving us an understanding. If you're going to go to them, if you're going to fulfill that responsibility, if you're going to uh, exercise that role as a Christian leader, you need to make sure that you are approaching it as if that older individual, that older man in your life and in your church, as if he is your father. Respect and restraint. Personal righteousness and coming at it with the purpose of restoration. Child of God, how is it that we collectively are to treat the older uh, men in our life, the older uh, Christians that are a part of this church, we are to treat them as if they are our fathers? Respect and restraint and seasoning that relationship with personal righteousness and doing everything that we can to restore our relationship and to restore that individual into good graces of God. How about the younger men? How are we supposed to treat the younger men in our church? Timothy, as leader, if they're your brother. Now, we're going to get to sisters here in a little while. I didn't, grow, I didn't have any sisters growing up. I had two uh, brothers, older brothers. They were mean as snakes and twice as deadly, and uh, they, 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 it was tough. My, mom, my mom's got crown after crown after crown awaiting her in heaven for what she had to put up with from, from my brothers, not from me. I was, I was a good boy. But I know what a good brother is. They were mean. They were tough. But they made sure that no one was mean or no one was too tough with me other than them two. They would look out for me. They would, they would pick on me and beat on me and tie me up and practice wrestling moves on me. And uh, I had my head put through a plate glass window. I, uh, I was knocked unconscious a few different times. I had to go to the hospital a few times. I, I, was, I was challenged by my older brother Clint uh, to, uh, to run across the street and uh, get something from the store. And upon uh, I, I raced one of my friends. There was a tunnel that went under the street. I said, you go run, run the tunnel. I'll run, go over the top of the street. We'll see who gets there the fastest. This was again upon my brother Clint saying, go over there and get me something. I don't, I don't remember exactly what it was, but took the first step out on the road, heard a honk, turned, and got hit by a Buick. Broke two ribs, broke my teeth out, split my lips open. Brothers can be tough, amen? Um, They were mean. They could pick on me, but nobody else better even try. I, I remember a multitude of times where my mouth ended up in my brother Clint getting in a fight. I remember uh, one occasion we had just moved to an area uh, and uh, 
it kind of started with me and there was a whole family of individuals there in Arizona and we just moved from Texas and they were making fun of and mocking the way that we had talked and together we whooped that whole family I'm glad there's not any teenagers in here do as I say not as I do amen But as I've got older, I understand uh, that, that that relationship changes and, and there's a different level of respect and camaraderie and uh, brotherhood and, uh, that, that exists. Because we've been through the same kind of things, raised by the same, uh, same mom and uh, same experiences. So how is it that if I, as a leader, am going to go to... Uh, a younger man in the church that I am supposed to recognize and consider and treat as if he is my brother, the right kind of brother, how is it that I am supposed to go about that? Younger men in the church, treat them as your brother, which means that if you're going to rebuke them, it's not that you can't rebuke, it's that if you're going to instruct them with the purpose of immediate correction, you need to do it while guarding them and guarding yourself. Young people can be rather emotional, young men. And I'm not talking about the same kind of emotions uh, that young ladies have. I'm talking about you can go to correct someone and they can get real angry real fast. Right? I, I, I know uh, there was a handful of times, me as a young person, someone would say something uh, just a little bit off, off color to me and it would, I would respond uh, a lot of times by getting my tail whooped. Uh, but, but I would give it everything that I got. Even, even when it came to, to teachers in school, there were times where, uh, where I got myself in trouble. My mouth was writing checks that my body didn't want to cash, and uh, I got in big-time trouble, got suspended, got uh, kicked off uh, uh, the school buses, got, got in all kinds of different trouble because a teacher tried to correct me. We can be... Young men can be rather emotional, right? Emotions can run high. The hormones running high. Uh, anger being uh, have just a, a short fuse. Well, we need to approach, even if it's with the purpose of rebuke, we need to approach them as our younger brothers, uh, our younger uh, brothers, as if. We are approaching while continually guarding their emotion, continually guarding the perception. We may be going to them out of a heart of love, but that's not always how they're going to receive it. Right? Even as a parent. I don't know why you're always coming down on me. I'm not coming down. I'm trying to make sure that you turn out to be a pretty good young man. I don't know why I got to get up and do all these chores. I don't know why I got to... Uh, worked it. I don't know why I got to do it. Why can't Whitney do it? That sounds like Weston, right? I'm trying to teach you good work ethic. I'm trying to, uh, to teach you how to clean up after yourself or do, do your part, be a part of this family. When we are working with one another, trying to accomplish the, the will of God as different personalities with different experiences, different age groups, those that are younger than us, even if we have to rebuke them. If we're led to rebuke them, we do it uh, while uh, as if they are our younger brothers, as if we are uh, continually putting into practice the, the mindset of guarding after their emotions, doing all that we can to make sure they don't fly off the handle. Take into consideration that they're emotional uh, beings. Taking into consideration they may not perceive it the way that we're putting it out there. Considering that with every word that we say, Not just that, but their experience. I think as Christians, a lot of times we do a disservice to the Lord by not giving Him the time that He has allotted for a new believer, a new convert to grow and mature into the person that He wants them to be. We expect them to be who we are immediately. We expect them, hey, that they're going to read their Bibles every day. We expect that they're going to have a consistent prayer life, uh, pray uh, for hours on the end. That we, we expect that they're going to be faithful every time that the door uh, of the church is open. We expect them to be here. 
I mean, after all, you, you're, you're a child of God now. Understand, they have a, however short their lifetime is, they have a lifetime of bad habits that they're going to have to get rid of before these good habits are really going to take hold. And we have to understand that if God is doing a work in them, we need to give God, we need to give the Holy Spirit the time that He knows is necessary to grow them. Now, I'm not talking about us compromising. I'm not talking about us uh, sweeping sin under the rug in any way. I'm talking about us being patient and long-suffering as the Lord Jesus Christ is and has always been towards us. Allowing for Christians to grow and mature. They may not be where we are spiritually, it may take them some time. But if we're treating uh, the younger, uh, if we're talking about the younger men, if we're treating them as if they are our younger brothers, we, we wouldn't expect our younger brothers to be, uh, to be where we are. I mean, uh, we talk to them about school, and uh, what do you mean you don't know this? Well, you just learned it this year, and I'm two years behind you, right? It's... it's doesn't make any sense to have an expectation of them of being where we are if they haven't been in this as long as we have or if they haven't had Christian leadership like we have. Amen. All right. So young men, young women, uh, we treat the young men uh, with uh, um, by guarding their emotions, their precepts, their experience. We also uh, uh, rebuke them if we've got to rebuke them while guiding them. That means that we're guiding them both with the things that we're saying. We're guiding them in truth. But we're also guiding them with our example. Don't tell someone they're doing wrong if, if you don't got it right either. Judge not lest you be judged. First cast the mote out of your eye, right? Guide them with our words. Guide them with our example. And one of the most amazing aspects of guidance is the fact that it is a picture of support. A guide doesn't uh, uh, doesn't go out in front and and run as fast as he can and hope that the guy can read his footprints and, and keep up that way. No, the the idea of being a guide is walking alongside. We have we have a, a loving Savior. We have a Holy Spirit that's in us that lives inside of us who is a guide. He is with us every step of the way. As a child of God, if we're going to uh, to rebuke a, a younger person in the church, then we need to do it uh, with the attitude and the heart of guiding them, using the Word of God as our guide and uh, guide for their life, using uh, y- using our life as an example, and guiding them through support, walking alongside. So while guarding, while guiding, and the third one is while being genuine the entire time. I try to, every Sunday, I try to say hello and shake hands or give a high five or whatever it merits. I try to acknowledge every young person that's here at our church. Every visitor that comes, I try to acknowledge. But, uh, but, but the young folks, I try to acknowledge because I, I learned as a youth pastor, I learned very fast that young people can see right through phonies, fakes. What does it mean to be genuine? Well, if I'm going to be able to rebuke a young person for something that they're doing wrong, they need to understand that I'm doing it with... Uh, with a mindset of guarding and guiding them, but I'm also genuine, which means that I am wanting. I am wanting things better in their life for their sake. I'm wanting their life to be pleasing in the eyes of God, not just so that I can mark it off my list and say, look at how good of a job I've done. No, I'm doing it because I want for them what's best. I want them to experience the hand of blessing, uh, the, the love of God, that relationship. I want them uh, to, uh, to escape the, uh, the tragedies or escape the regrets that I have as an older individual. I, I want for them better. So in my rebuking, that's me saying something with the purpose and the intent of immediate correction, right? If I'm going to rebuke a younger person, me being genuine, me being, uh, me being wanting in this I've got to ask myself the question, am I saying this because it is just the way that it is? You shouldn't be listening to that. 
because it's sinful. You shouldn't be doing this because it's leading you astray. You shouldn't be uh, alone with an opposite member of the, uh, uh, with a member of the opposite sex. You shouldn't uh, you shouldn't uh, disrespect your parents or your elders. You uh, you shouldn't be watching these things. Am I saying it because it's true? I should be saying it because it's true. But is that my motivation or me being genuine? Am I saying it because I truly want to help that individual with their walk with God? We understand there's a big difference, right? Being genuine, not only wanting what's best for them, but it's also being willing to be both their example and their support, the two things we've already looked at. It's one thing to say you want to help. It's one thing to say that you love somebody. It's one thing to say uh, you want their life to... Uh, to be free of regret. You want them to, uh, to live for the Lord and experience all the blessing. It's another thing to be willing to do something about it. I got 10 minutes and I've only gone through the first, se- first one. All right, here we go. We got half a page and we'll cut off there. So that was how to treat men. Older men in the church, treat them as your father. Younger men in the church, treat them as your brother. So how do we treat women? Older women in the church, treat them as your mother. Now, I wasn't raised with a, uh, um, I didn't live with my dad. I was raised by, uh, most of the time, a single mom, raised us three boys the best that she could. Some may would consider me a mama's boy. I'm okay with that. You don't like it, we can talk about it in the parking lot. Amen. There was a multitude of times as a young person where I got in fights because somebody said something about my mama. And all the, every time she would say, I can stick up for myself. Well, you couldn't then because you weren't here. And you don't know what they said. The older women in the church, Timothy, you're to treat them as if they are your mothers. Your mother. The correct way to treat your mother is to treat her with compassion and love, right? She's been through so many things that you'll never go through. And he's speaking to Timothy, who is a male. Not only has she gone through things that you've never gone through, but she processes those things in a way that you'll never completely understand. Men and women are created different. So we have compassion. I try to put myself in the situation of if I knew that my own mother was living in sin, how, how would I approach that? Well, I would have to, first of all, approach it with love, compassion, but also with, with great care. Caring for her sensitivity. Nobody wants to be told that, they've been done, that they're doing wrong, especially by their own children, Right? I approach the situation with sensitivity. I show care for uh, her sensitivity. I also show care for her soul and her spirit. I don't want to crush. I don't want to hurt. I don't want to uh, further the pain. I don't want to bring any more pain upon my own mom, right? How is it that I'm supposed to approach a, a lady in the church who's living in sin or has done me wrong? I do it with care and compassion. As if she's my own mother. That's what Paul's telling Timothy. I also do it with caution. The Bible tells us that the women are the weaker vessel. Uh, Women are created more uh, more emotional beings. They're not any worse or any less than than a man in any way. They're just different. Their chemical makeup is different. Their personalities are different. I treat them as that weaker vessel. But I also treat... My own mother, I would also treat my own mother needing to remember that she is a daughter of the king. This is about the church, isn't it? I'm not going to be disrespectful because she's my mom. That's, that's part of the requirement. That's one of God's big ten, right? Honor your father and your mother. She's not just my mom. She's a daughter of the king. And by the way, every lady in the church older than me daughter of the king 
you think about that and boy it would sure change the way that we treat one another wouldn't it continuing the illustration of her being uh, 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 treating her like a mother not only is she a weaker vessel or the weaker vessel the daughter of a king but she is your mother and just based on the fact that she is your mother that she is worthy to re be respected as such okay but lastly in this treating her with caution my mother's a huge blessing the role of a mother is a huge blessing there's a different relationship that a, a, a boy has with his mom and a boy has with his dad there's a different relationship that a girl has with her mom than what she has with her dad moms are designed the, 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 the role of a mother is designed of one of care and compassion and nurturing Something that a dad, there's some things that moms do that dads will never be able to do. Roles that they'll be able to play that a man will never be or a father will never be able to fill. Mothers, the design of that relationship between mother and child is one of blessing. A mom is a blessing. There are times where I, still today, I'm 40-something years old. If I have a rough day, I can call Mama, and she's going to encourage me. I'm going to have a good time talking to her, and she's going to, she's going to say nice things about me and uh, build me back up and tell me to get back. That's what a mom does. The older women in the church treat them as if they're, they're your own mother. You treat them with compassion. You treat uh, uh, the situation. If you got a rebuke, you treat it with care, and you treat it with great caution. But don't fail to address the problem without offering a solution. That's, fixed, that's addressing this situation, this rebuke of an older uh, woman in the church with correction. Don't fail to address the problem without offering solutions. So... You, Older men, treat them as if they are your father. Younger men, treat them as if they're your brother. Older women, treat them as if they're your mother. Timothy, younger women, treat them as if they are your sister. What would that look like? Well, I didn't see it in my own upbringing, but I can see it in Weston and Whitney and what I want as a father Weston to do for Whitney. When she's struggling with something, that he's already got a handle on, I want him to be an encouragement to her, right? And a good brother is going to do that. Now, they may fight like cats and dogs, but in a, a perfect world, in a perfect family, they're going to be there to encourage and, uh, and protect, to esteem a younger sister. Holding him in high regard not approaching the, uh, the encouragement or not approaching the difficulty or not approaching uh, the, the, the failure to be all that they should be, not approaching it with a, uh, with a bad attitude, not making them feel uh, insignificant, inferior, or stupid in any way. We don't want that. Esteeming them, encouraging them, and enlightening them through instruction and guidance. That's what... That's what a good older brother does for a younger sister, right? This is Paul talking to Timothy. This is how you are to treat the people of the church, but we understand that this is to be an example. This is how we treat one another. How is it? Let's go over it real quick and we'll be done. How is it that we, anybody and everybody in here as a child of God, how is it we are supposed to treat the men of this church? With respect and restraint, we approach it living a righteous life. And any confrontation that we have to have with them, we do it for the purpose of restoration. Amen. We approach them with an idea and an understanding of guarding and guiding and being genuine in all that we say and in all that we do. If we treat each other the way that we're supposed to, if we treat the men and uh, older men and younger men of this church the way that we're supposed to, we have the promise of God's hand of blessing on this church 
and on our lives. How are we supposed to treat the women of the church? With love, compassion, care, caution, and a willingness of correction. But only correcting while we have the heart of encouragement, a desire of esteeming them, and enlightening them to be more of what God would have them to be. These two verses are pretty profound to me. If we want to be anything as far as the church, as far as the body of Christ, if we're going to continue on and to be a force for this world to reckon with, if we're going to be successful in doing what God has called us to do, we need to work together as the body of Christ, working in unity, in unison, getting along, working together, putting differences aside, coming together with the purpose of bringing glory and honor and showing obedience to the head, which is Christ. If we're going to be successful in that, we need to learn how to get along. We're not always going to see eye to eye. We all have a little bit of a rough edge sometimes and a prickly attitude. But that doesn't mean that we can treat each other with disrespect in any way whatsoever. No, we are to treat our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to treat the, our, our fellow laborers, the, uh, the uh, other members of the body of Christ. We are to treat them as our fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters. Treat them as if they're family because they are.